We just got back from an epic 10 day road trip around the Balkans. It was such an amazing experience and I feel like this is such an underrated part of Europe. Really hard to find information online about the best things to do beforehand. This is a follow up to give you the tips that I wish I had and everything that I would do differently if I were to go back and do it again. Okay, so first off, what are the Balkans? This is actually trickier to answer than you think. The Balkan Peninsula is a peninsula jutting out into the Mediterranean just to the east of Italy. But that doesn't mean all the countries on this peninsula are considered the Balkans. This term has a lot of cultural connotations. For the sake of this video, I'm just gonna be focusing on the countries that were formerly part of Yugoslavia. So Montenegro, Croatia, Bosnia, Slovenia, and then there's also Serbia and Kosovo, but we didn't go there, so I will be talking about those ones a little bit less. Just to make sure I cover this historical context, back in the 90s there was a pretty violent civil war throughout the Balkans. This was particularly devastating for Bosnia and Kosovo, and this is still a very sensitive subject for some of the people who live in the Balkans today. With that said, the war is no longer happening. I think there's a lot of people maybe in the US or in Western Europe who tend to still have this image of the Balkan civil war. The war is over and it's very, very safe for travelers now. So just a general overview of the countries in the Balkans. So Slovenia and Croatia are both part of the EU, but only Slovenia is in Schengen. Even though it's not in the EU, Montenegro uses the Euro. The two other countries we went to, Bosnia and Croatia, that don't use the Euro will accept Euros pretty much everywhere. Each one of these countries technically has its own language, but these languages are all very similar and are considered like part of the Southern Slavic language family. Even if you don't speak <laughs> any of these languages, you will be totally fine with just English. I'm not sure we met anybody who didn't speak English while we were there. Our trip was a road trip, so the first thing to talk about is renting a car. <laughs> Our original plan was to rent a car in Tirana, Albania and drive up the Adriatic coast through Montenegro, Croatia, Slovenia, circle over and drop the car in Venice. We learned after buying tickets that it's actually really hard to rent a car in Albania that you can take across the borders. We checked probably half a dozen car rental sites and not a single one would insure the car if you take it across the border. So we pivoted and instead decided to fly into Dubrovnik and rent a car from there. Just a fair warning, renting a car in one place and dropping it off somewhere else uh, is actually really expensive. I think we spent 1600 US dollars on the car rental, but about a thousand of that was the car drop fee. So dropping the car off in a location that was different than the one we picked it up in was a thousand dollars. Obviously this is a huge amount of money, so you can bring down a lot of your costs if you just pick a central location and do a loop from there. In order to cross borders with the car, you need to have the green card. This is just a card proving that there is insurance on the car. Not all of the border guards will ask you for it, but some of them will, and then you'll need to hand this over. Having a different pickup and drop off location will sort of be a good enough implication that they'll prepare this for you. But if you do have the same pickup and drop off, then you'll have to make sure you let them know so that they can prepare this ahead of time for when you pick the car up. Okay, so now you have your car. What is driving in the Balkans like? Well, it's actually kind of a mixed bag. The best driving was definitely in Croatia. The highways were super new and totally empty. They were fast, they were convenient. It was some of the best driving I have ever done in Europe. Bosnia was the complete opposite. The roads were full of potholes and the drivers were sort of all over the place. Some of them would be going really fast and would tailgate you for a long time and others would be going 20 kilometers an hour below the speed limit. <laughs> so you kind of had a little bit of everything. Uh, and then Slovenia and Montenegro were somewhere in between. One thing I will say is the traffic was the worst in Slovenia. A couple things that I just want to point out. It's a little unclear to me how the speed limit correlates to how fast you should be driving on the roads here. So in some places, people were driving like 20, 40 kilometers over the speed limit. And then in other places, they were going way under. So we were just trying to go with the flow of traffic. The second thing I want to point out is that when, you were, when we were driving on the highways, um, particularly in Croatia, there would be places where one of the lanes would close for construction and the amount of highway between where they start asking you to merge and where the lane is totally closed is actually very short. So if you're going really fast, it can happen 
like in less than a few seconds. So just be mindful of that. And finally, this might be just like a cultural thing. People won't pull over to let you pass. So if you're stuck behind someone going like kind of slow on a winding road, you will be stuck behind them forever until you just like make a move to pass them in the other lane. Let's talk about money. I think there's this idea that like the Balkans would be a budget or inexpensive destination, but this is really not totally true. So Bosnia and Montenegro were both a little bit more of like good deals compared to some other destinations in Europe. But Croatia was really expensive. Not like Switzerland expensive, but definitely more expensive than I was expecting. And Dubrovnik was the most expensive place that we went to on this road trip. I think Bosnia was the cheapest, but there was sort of this feeling like they were nickel and diming you for everything. So like you would go somewhere and you have to pay like $2 for parking and then like $2 for the entrance and then like $2 for something else. And it just like was a lot of little fees for just like tiny things. All right, now I'll go through country by country and just talk about what are some of the best things to do. So we started in Montenegro, so I'll start there. Montenegro is a super tiny country and it's also one of the youngest countries in Europe since it was declared independent from Serbia in 2006. Despite its small size, it has a lot of natural beauty. While we were there, we spent two nights in Kotor, the old town, and then we went on a day trip to see Skadar Lake and we stopped at the beach at Sveti Stefan. If I were to go back to Montenegro, I think I would spend at least a couple days in Dermatur National Park. That's a big national park up in the north of Montenegro. It's supposed be really beautiful. We didn't go, but I would love to go back and go hiking there. I also wish we spent a little bit more time at the beach. Skadar Lake was kind of a miss for me. You can check out my Montenegro video to see a little more why that would be the case. It just didn't really do it for me. And then I loved the Kotor Old Town. The whole Bay of Kotor was so beautiful. I'm so glad we spent some time there. All right, next on the list is Croatia. Croatia is one of the fastest growing tourism destinations in the world, and it is super easy to see why. So when you enter the country from Montenegro, the first major city you'll come to is Dubrovnik. I would say Dubrovnik is a do not miss destination. Definitely very expensive, but it is such a cool old walled city. And of course you might be thinking, oh, but there's a ton of like old walled cities in Europe. True. <laughs> <laughs> but Dubrovnik is just like so beautiful. And of course, since it was the filming location of King's Landing and Game of Thrones, it has gotten a huge bump in tourism, but don't let that put you off. It's still a really great city to go explore. As you continue up the coast, Croatia is known for having a lot of really amazing islands. So we went to Havar. We spent two nights in the Havar Old Town and it was fantastic. I would go back so soon. We were there sort of right at the end of the summer season. I think we were there like in the last week of September and some things were starting to close down so it's probably a little more happening if you go a little earlier in the season. I wish we could have spent a little more time there to do some of the wine tasting on the island or maybe go and check out Brock because that's where I guess the really famous beach is. After that we took a ferry to Split. We had breakfast in Split and then drove to Plivici Lakes National Park. This was one of the absolute highlights of the entire Balkans road trip for me. Uh, if you're in Croatia and considering not going to Plivici, consider again. You should definitely go. <laughs> When we went to Plitovici, it was pouring rain. And despite that, I am still telling you that it's an amazing destination. You should absolutely check it out if you're in the area. Finally, to wrap it up, we went and stayed a night at Ravinia. Uh, this is a city on the coast in the Istrian Peninsula, which is known for being a gastronomic destination and also very famous for its truffles. We really didn't get to spend that much time there. I think we took this unexpected day trip to Plitovici and I think it's probably worthwhile to go back and explore it a little more. Even though I'm a little bit out of order now, we did take a day trip into Bosnia. We went from Dubrovnik into Mostar and then stopped also at Blagaj and Krivica Waterfall. In case you're not really familiar with the geography, the part of Croatia that Dubrovnik sits in is actually completely separate from the rest of Croatia. There is a little sliver of Bosnia that sort of cuts in between them to get uh, access to the Adriatic coast. So there is sort of no way to drive between Dubrovnik and the rest of Croatia without entering Bosnia. Since we were already crossing the border, we thought, hey, let's make a day of it and go see Mostar. Most people visit Mostar as a day trip from Dubrovnik, and I think this is a mistake. Mostar is a really cool city and there's actually quite a lot to do. Probably my biggest regret from the trip is that we didn't spend just one night there. Blagaj was really cool. This is a Sufi house that's just built sort of right up in this massive 
cliff on a river. It's really cool. And there's some hiking trails from there. And then finally we went to Kravicha Falls. Knowing now in hindsight that we just didn't have enough time to do some of the other stuff we wanted to do, that would have been what I would have skipped. But if we had spent a night in Mostar, then we wouldn't have needed to skip anything. <laughs> We just scratched the surface by going to Mostar and going to Kravicha Falls and sort of the things that every single person who goes across the border goes to see. All right, and then the last country on our trip was Slovenia. So we went to Slovenia to go hiking on the Juliana Trail. This is a 170 mile trail around Trigla National Park, but we actually just did the 50 kilometers from Lake Bled to Lake Bauhin. Slovenia, I think of the Balkans, is sort of the most well-known as a trekking destination because the Juliana Alps are just sort of known for being really beautiful. Unfortunately, we got pretty bad weather while we were there. I think we had two days of rain out of a total of four days. So not great <laughs> but the days that were clear were super beautiful and it looked beautiful and then we also just spent a morning in Ljubljana we did a free walking tour and then just had lunch that was a big surprise Ljubljana was a much cooler city than I expected it to be it's got this sort of old town that's set up just for pedestrians which is really I love that <laughs> any cities that are pedestrian friendly I totally love and last but not least, I will talk about food. <laughs> no one is going to the Balkans as a culinary destination, but I just want to call out some of the better meals that we had while we were there. The two meals that really stand out Canoba Manego in Havar Old Town. This is a old house that has been converted into a restaurant, and I think their gimmick is it's like grandma's food or like mom's cooking so they had one dish called like grandma's vegetables and we got that and they were great and then the second one i want to call out is my slovenian dumplings in ljubljana forget everything you know about dumplings the slovenian dumplings are completely different but they're still totally delicious this was the best food bargain i think we had on the whole trip let me know in the comments if you have been on a balkan road trip or if you're planning to go I'd love to hear about it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And if you like this video, then consider subscribing. It really helps the channel. All right, thanks. Bye.